Good morning, church family. My name is Cindy, and I want to welcome you to the Christian Life Center for those that are in our sanctuary and those that are joining us online. So I've been given the privilege this morning to read our Bible verse as we uh, prepare for worshiping. Um, and as I was preparing in my heart, my mind with this verse, I was just reminded of the awesome and amazingness of God. And this Bible verse gives such a visual. So if you could try to picture as I read this, just the awesome and powerfulness of God. So it's Psalm 68, uh, verses 1 through 4. For the director of music of David, a psalm, a song. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. As smoke is blown away by the wind, may you blow them away. As wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing praise to his name, extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord and rejoice before him. Please stand and sing and worship with us as we rejoice in the Lord today.
hear you lift your voices. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of the in the day. wonderful church. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I Something that's of worth 
that will bless your heart. Sing with me. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things ourselves it's all about you we can lay everything at your feet you can remember who we are and who you are thank you Lord for that opportunity to come together as the body of Christ and to do that and to lift you up and rejoice in who you are and all that you've done for us God and so this morning we lift the service to you, Lord. We give you praise and worship. We ask you to fill us. We thank you for all that you do and for taking the burdens of our lives from us. This is all about you. Not just this morning, God, but as we leave, it's all about you. Help us to remember that. Help us to carry that with us. It's all about you, Jesus. May we fix our eyes on you this morning. We love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. 
And at this time, we would like to dismiss the children in middle school. Great. We are so... Wait, when our children minister that way, which says that the Lord uh, has established praise in the mouth of children to silence the foe and the avenger. It's a powerful spiritual dynamic, and thank you for leading us so much. Uh, it's always great to be in the house of the presence of God. We know it's not a physical location, but when we gather together, uh, it's a powerful experience, and especially welcome those who are also joining us online or in the parking lot, but it is good to be in the house of God together. And this morning, it's especially good to be in the house of God because Jeff and Kathy Lample are in the house. Uh, and uh, if you, yeah, you all know, just in case somebody doesn't know, uh, Jeff and Kathy led this church through remarkable seasons of spiritual growth and dynamism uh, for decades and are faithfully serving God in Salzburg, Austria. So I'm going to ask them if they would come forward uh, and to share a word of update, and then they're going to lead us in prayer. So again, let's give a, a real, you already did, but let's give a big welcome to Jeff and Kathy as they come up. Very appropriate. Well, thank you. you. You may be seated. <laughs> thank you so much. That is so special. This is our church home. We've got two church homes right now, one in Salzburg, Austria, and you. And this feels so good just to uh, come home. Um, we are the... Uh, pastor couple of Salzburg International Christian Church. We are a, an English-speaking church in Salzburg, Austria. Austria is a German-speaking country located in Central uh, Europe. It's the, it's the one that does not have kangaroos. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there's shirts that say that in the kiosks. Um, so it's like an airport, similar to your built, this is built on an airport. There are people who come from all over the world to Salzburg to study. There's a big university there, especially music. It's the birthplace of Mozart, so the Mozarteum is a place where people come to study music. And uh, they're there for maybe a year or two years or five years. Um, and there are other reasons that people come to Salzburg also, but they will be there for a while and then leave. And so our particular church was founded um, decades ago for the purpose of providing a place of worship for those who speak English primarily as a second or third language. Because people will come, most people around the world speak English, but are, are not able to speak German. And so um, we have been there. We are now in our third year. And I want to say that although uh, I have loved pastoring, just being able to get to know the stories of each person in the church from, again, all over the world, um, worship is the main thing that we do. And when we worship on Sunday mornings, um, we are a small congregation, and you are a large congregation, but it's been impressed upon me that it doesn't matter how big a group of people is. When that congregation begins to worship, and we are allowing God to be our focus, and in that, God elevates us out of ourselves into himself. And we do that with you here in Pennsylvania and with millions and millions and millions of churches all over planet Earth. And on Sunday mornings when, when, when we, by God, are lifted up in worship, there's some way in which um, the world holds. There's some way in which the rest of the world is elevated with us. And I think it's so powerful uh, to think about that. Kathy and I come home from worship each Sunday, and uh, we 
turn on our YouTube or whatever it is at 3 or it's 445, and we worship with you again. Oh, that's awesome. And we see people. I'm like, there's Pat Clark. I see Pat. <laughs> and LK. And so it's so exciting to see everybody. Um, so, yeah, it's German speaking, and most people speak English, but some people don't. And so my phrase is, oh, what's, um, sorry, sorry, what's sorry? Schuldigung, mein Deutsch is nicht gut. Yeah. And and the little boy Sammy that we got to know says Nietzscht. And I'm like, Nietzscht. No, no. Nietzscht. And I'm like, okay. And he, this is a little boy who is, uh, his parents are Hungarian and Filipino, so he knows English, German, Hungarian, and some Filipino. And he's eight years old and he's correcting me. It's, it's just so precious. Yeah. But um, we are so happy to be back here. Um, it's. <laughs> Uh, I have I have my clipboard here, so I have a couple of things. Um, so we moved during COVID, and it, things were pretty isolated then, so we didn't really do much. But the second year, things started to open up, and um, we started to have Bible study. We have women's Bible study morning and night. Um, we have a marriage group. We have potlucks. We've got to know our neighbors. Um, in our women's group, we have women from these different places. American, Scotland, England, Nigeria, South Africa, Bolivia, Hong Kong, Austria, Kenya, Philippines. And it's so nice because it's all ages, young yeah. and old. And we get together. And it, to hear these young girls are so on fire for the Lord. We have young girls. And then the older women are so grounded and their faith is, has such a depth to it. And that's been so good. Um, I learned so much. But one thing that just has me stirred so much recently is that we have an American passport and we have an Austrian residence card. So we are, have this residence in both places. And when I think about coming back here, it just makes me so happy. And I have our two youngest grandchildren that wanted to come up here, but then they chickened out. Um, <laughs> they're, they're with, and so our family's here, and we're, we're back for some different um, celebrations. But then when I think there, like, I'm so drawn, and I'm like, but it's so beautiful, and the church is so lovely. And then I think to myself, you are just so spoiled and to have that <laughs> yearning for how can you yearn for both and then I started thinking about um, that holy discontent that you've taught on before like it's that I'm hoping it's a holy discontent where <laughs> we are all given that um, yearning for something more for something um, beyond and so I listened to Christy Purifoy I've read her books and just recently she wrote this and it helped me so much. And I just want to read this little part. In some seasons we wander, in some seasons we put down roots. But unlike the trees, we humans can stretch our roots in more than one place. This is a blessing, but as it is with most blessings, it isn't always easy to receive. I can feel uncomfortable, even painful at times. And then th these are her roots. She said, I'm at home here under the maples in Pennsylvania. I miss the honey locust trees of my lakeside neighborhood in Chicago. And this is the part that just really spoke to me. And I think this, this is going on with, with me, with us, with everybody, really. And I long for the city of the tree of life that will be our perfect home one day. So that's, that's what I've learned, that we have that in us. And um, I think... And we're, we're going to come to Chicken Soup tomorrow, so we have some pretty cool stories. Um, but I think that's it for now, right? <laughs> so, Bob, if you want to come up for a moment, would that be all right? Sure. I'd like to just pray over you and the church. Thank you. So, Thank you so much. So, Father God... Um, Thank you for this moment of being able to be home for Kathy and me, yet we are always home when we are with you. So Lord, we pray that you, your uh, mercies, your power, your beauty, 
your um, desire to lift CLC, uh, all the members within it, above themselves, into you, uh, become more manifest than ever. I thank you what's, for what's happened over the last few months. And I pray, Lord, that you build CLC into the kind of people who transcend themselves and in doing so find the joy for which they were built and be that kind of joy for the community and beyond that is only found in you. We pray, Lord, that Bob finds a home, Bob and Liz find a home soon and that the support they need is right here within this church. And we ask for your blessing on all aspects of the ministry of CLC and Bob and his family. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. So meaningful. Jeff's a giant in more way than one, right? Amen. Amen. Um, it truly is, uh, it's, it's a blessing. You don't get to choose uh, the people who pour in to the life of church, but I'm just so blessed by the staff, by the leaders God has used, and by the different building blocks of the church that God has used to build this place. And uh, it's through imperfect instruments that God builds that, but it's through the consistency of seeking him and centering lives on Christ that make this place live with the presence of God. And this series that we're looking at uh, is a a series called The Why, Why We Do What We Do. And we're returning to kind of some of the essential things that are going to be true of a church wherever the church is healthy. And we're gonna look at the most important topic, I think, apart from just the gospel itself in terms of church health, and that is the design that God intended for his church, his people to have when he looks at them and when they manifest who he is. And that really is... Uh, the spirit of prayer. Uh, I want to read two sections of scripture. We're going to dive into these scriptures. Um, They are first from Isaiah 56. And the one is about the temple uh, and um, its role. And in verse six and seven, look at these verses. It says, and foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love uh, the name of the Lord and to be his servants and who keep his Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast uh, to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. That phrase may be familiar to you because it's picked up in the New Testament when Jesus uh, came into the temple in, in his one, uh, what looked like a uh, messianic uh, temper tantrum <laughs> but was a principled response to something that had displaced what ought to be there when he said, my house, my father's house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. So it was these verses in Isaiah 56 that were resonating in Jesus uh, as he came into Jerusalem uh, preparing to offer himself on the cross. And when he came into Jerusalem, he first came with weeping Uh, The Bible actually says that he wept convulsively, really throbbing in his heart over Israel. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, if you only knew uh, the the means to your peace, um, but it has been hidden from your eyes. So he first wept over them, but then he came in, uh, and I want us to turn to that section. John chapter 2 records this event of Jesus coming into the temple. And I want to read that section. John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And, and here's the setting. It's Passover. So think of it like uh, the crowds of a, a July 4th gathering uh, prior to COVID. <laughs> or, or maybe uh, uh, I was there in the Phillies World Championship Parade in 2008. And like the city's just thronged with people. So all these crowds, everybody's there from all these different ethnicities and nations around for the Jewish Passover. And we read this. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Just just focus on that verse. You have Jesus going in, and he is not meek and mild. Look on this little child. He is seeing tables. Uh, and, and these tables were actually meant to be there. 
because they were to facilitate the pilgrims. The pilgrims had to offer unblemished lambs. Some of them traveled so far that if they had brought the lambs with them, they would have been blemished. So they had a system of, of making it convenient, like easy access for the worshipers, and so they would, would exchange money so they could buy unblemished lambs, right? But they had extorted the process and turned it into, instead of a bridge to welcome the outsider, they had made this, this barrier set up in the inner courts and charging people like, you know, you know like the airport rates for food? Or like, you know, if you go to a ball game, you know, you know, like the, the last uh, Super Bowl, if you wanted a pretzel and a Coke, it was $23. Like, so they were charging these foreigners like different Venmo rates, okay? And they've got their tables set up and they're full of cords and Jesus goes up and he is not subtle. He is flipping tables, flipping tables. And I want you to note in verse 15, it says that he actually not only flipped the tables with the coins, but he grabbed the coins and threw the coins. I actually never noticed that before. So he is lathered up, right? And to those who sold doves, verse 16, this is really interesting, to those who sold doves, do you know that God is easy access for everybody? If you make, you know, if you're CEO in DuPont, and by the way, if you're here today, um, we have a mortgage to pay off, I'd love to talk to you. Um, <laughs> because that might, that might be a proportional tithe. You might not even notice it, right? But, but, but if you're not, and you make a very meager income, and you need to offer this sacrifice, it says, to those who sold doves. And I wonder if Jesus didn't target those who sold doves because he had a special heart for those who had very few, little resources to get there. The person who had the very least and I wondered if he was thinking about his own mom and dad, because in Luke we read that when they went to the temple, um, they had to pay the price, not of, not of the lamb, that was too expensive, but the turtle dove. And he said to those who were selling the doves and charging the different Venmo rates, the different exchange rates, and tacking on a big airport Super Bowl price to the dove price, he said, get these out of here. <laughs> You know, and he said, stop turning my father's house into a market. And it was his disciples that remembered that is written in a psalm, zeal for your house will consume me. And, and I want to look at this phrase, um, my father's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. Um, Jeff and Kathy, you're ministering to all these nations. And Jeff just talked about how worship, the most important thing they do, this is the vision of God for his people. Uh, we're not located in one uh, you know, geopolitical nation, but we are a people who transcend all of that because we're gonna bless all the nations. That's, that's our, our glorious heritage as, as believers. And the first thing we see that Jesus does and that he's so lathered up by, and you know, when you get to know someone, you, you don't really know them all that well until you know what makes them angry. Uh, it's why long courtships are recommended for couples. Uh, because if, like, if, if you're a couple and you're starry-eyed, glossy-eyed, and you, you are planning the wedding and like you've never had conflict, boy, the red sirens sign off to me. You've never had a conflict. You know, a, a couple you meet, uh, I've met with a couple and, and basically they look at each other just in love and they say like, we've never even had an ill feeling toward each other. <laughs> You're like, wow. The depth of that relationship is such thin ice, I don't think you could even, you know, drop a coin on it without it breaking it, you know? So, so you don't know someone until you know what gets them angry. Most of the stuff that gets us angry is because it gets in our own way. Jesus is not like that. His anger is perfect holiness, and he sees something that causes him to come absolutely undone, it appears. It's like a holy rampage in Jesus. What is it? What is it? And as that something that was, was not disallowed from being there, it was supposed to be, a, again, a bridge and an on-ramp, had been displaced and had become a barrier to what God really wants to see with his people. It was, it was out of place and it was displaced. And it was hideous. Amen. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you are... I, I was walking, I think, down by Spring Lawn, and I saw some, some field mice running across. I don't, anybody 
not a fan of field mice. If you run across them outside, does it cause any of you to jump back? Um, right? And, and others of you, if you see them in the field, you know, are you okay? It's like, oh, cute little mouse. But, but if that mouse pokes his head out of the Cheerios box, <laughs> right? You have a different response. You have a different response. I, I remember talking to, to a missionary who is um, very proud of the fact that he was not afraid of snakes and that he had a healthy respect and was, you know. But one day he went into his kitchen and actually there was literally a spitting cobra at the top of the china cabinet that had lodged himself up there. And he, this guy who was not afraid of snakes actually got out his his kind of basic shotgun, and he shot up the china cabinet trying to kill that snake. <laughs> you always think of like, you know, Bill Murray and Caddyshack blowing up the whole golf course because this gopher <laughs> is where he's not supposed to be. So what I want to point out to you that what God that Jesus so lathered up was that the, the house that was to be a house of prayer for all nations, and this was the design of the temple, you know, God is brilliant. Of course, he thinks of everything, right? And so in the design of the temple, did you know that the architecture of the temple was supposed to preach a sermon without words? And, and Solomon, when he dedicated the temple, and, and ancients tell us, like if you were coming into uh, to Israel, this, this huge, like the altar itself was just was 90 feet tall. So think of the spire. And by the way, I love the steeple that is on this blessed building. Uh, it's, it's somewhat rare in contemporary buildings sometimes. But, but it points its way up to God and to the mission of this church. And that's what the temple was supposed to do. The sheer white stone tacked with gold when a pilgrim was coming into Jerusalem was supposed to point their way to God. And Solomon prayed this. This is, this is 1 Kings 8. He prayed that the temple existed, and he said, so that the, all the peoples of the earth, and he's talking about the goyim, the nations, the Gentiles. He said, so that this was their mission to reach the outsider, so that they would know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. And they had taken that that was to be the welcome mat. Jesus was He's startling in his advocacy for the outsider to come in, really. And Jesus, knowing that he was going to be the temple that was going to have to be destroyed because this temple had become so corrupt that God was going to have to turn the wrecking ball to it, he was startled that the, that the very opposite of what God had intended, the temple was supposed to be a place where people from all nations come welcome the red carpet rolled out nobody's on the inside track because our god has made a way through the shed blood that jesus was about to accomplish on the cross was to to bring them in and he said they had turned it into a a marketeering place jesus actually called it a den of robbers and if you know that reference when jesus said you've turned it into a den of robbers uh, in this is also reported to us in mark 11 uh, is a lifting from Jeremiah 7 where the first temple became so corrupt that it had to be destroyed. And so now he comes in and the second temple, it's become so askew. And here's, here's, here's the practical point. Um, those money changers, they were supposed to be there to facilitate, to bring in, but, but, by, but they became obstacles to what God was doing and so here's the preaching point. It is very possible for things that are supposed to be in church and are a part of church to get distorted and magnified to where they become distorted and out of place so that what we really are supposed to be doing becomes a minor thing and all of a sudden we are majoring on things that were God expected to be there but he didn't expect them to dominate. And, and the dominate thing is a thing that is accessible to all people. It doesn't require a particular kind of spiritual gift. It doesn't require that you know a lot. It is simply the opening of your heart to the things that burden you to the God who wants to bear your burden. It, it is to be the house of prayer for all peoples. I, I want you to know, I mean, 
I'm fairly happy that you like preaching, but Jesus does not call it a house of preaching. I love that there is a strong um, response of worshiping God by singing and music, and it ought to be there, but he doesn't call it the house of singing. Uh, but he calls it the house of prayer because the house that God is building is to restore the communion, the, the sense of fellowship with God on our hearts that was, has been broken. And so it's, it's so interesting that you know when God birthed the church in the New Testament, it was not birthed by preaching per se, though Peter did preach. But it was birthed because the 120 disciples or so with, with the women leaders among them praying, um, the Holy Spirit fell and the church was birthed out of prayer. Um, we read that when the church responded and repented and, and were baptized, again, this, this class we're gonna have next week for anyone who's not been baptized before, that was their response. They received the gospel and they were baptized and the promise was for them and their children. But we read that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And, and that, that word devoted is, is a purposeful word. It means like Olympic athlete kind of devotion, not weekend warrior kind of devotion. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and it said, and to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to relationships and inner sharing, and they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And then it says, and they devoted themselves to prayers, a specific kind of ministry. Um, and then when there was a crisis in the church in the book of Acts, we read that um, they were ministering to many impoverished widows as they should do, as we should do, ministering to those who have fewest of resources. And it's said that uh, the apostles appointed um, people filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom to wait on tables so that they would not neglect the ministry of the word and prayer. It, it was to be it, it, absolutely essential. It's essential in the narrative of God. And this is prayer I have to say, I have to confess my sin in this, in that as I looked at that, as I'd say, that, yeah, the minister has to have plenty of time to study the word and also to pray about the word, but the, the actual word for prayer is not for praying so you know what to speak and, and say. That's important. But it's a whole ministry of prayer. Uh, and this is essential. And so, so when Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2, he says, I command, first of all, doesn't matter what tradition of Christian church you are, if you follow the Apostle Paul, he says, I command, first of all, what I want is for there to be prayers and petitions and intercessions and petitions made for all people. That's what he wanted first. And then I think, I think there may be some gender insight into this. In verse 8 of 1 Timothy 2, he says, I want the men everywhere to pray without wrath or disputing. He says, I want the men everywhere actually to lift up holy hands in prayer without wrath or disputing. And so prayer is, it's, it's not the spare wheel inside the car if you get in trouble, right? <laughs> but it's actually meant to be the steering wheel uh, of strength and stability in the church. And what Jesus saw is that that had been displaced through these mechanics uh, and it had become an obstruction. And so the prayer of Solomon, and I love, I think it's in the King James, he, uh, it's expressed this way, that Solomon prayed that the outsider would look at the church. And I, I would pray this for CLC, that the person on the outside who's far from God, they might look at that steeple and even just turn toward the reality that there is a God who cares about them. And, and he said I, that they would pray that the plague of their heart would be healed. Oh man, I relate to that, the plague of heart. Let me just tell you, nothing like moving will reveal to you the plague of your heart. <laughs> um, grace, <laughs> God's grace is so good. But, but this, is, this is the restorative purpose because, because prayer is simply coming to the place where your relationship with God is restored and you can unburden yourself in his presence and have that burden lifted. And if you're a part of the church through Jesus Christ, what you're part of is the people that God is recruiting to share the burden he has for burdened people and to lift them into his presence by prayer. 
the most important thing of, of, about prayer is not that it's, it's our you know, intercom to get what we need on a cruise ship of life or even a walkie-talkie in a time of war where you need uh, the ammunition, but, but the most important thing about prayer is communion with God. It's to restore the presence of God, to restore uh, the felt presence of God. And this is what Jesus could not tolerate that it had been squeezed out. And, and, and so he establishes this. Um, I, I love how in Revelation 8, it says that our prayers are so treasured by God, an almighty holy God treasures our imperfect and feeble and often inconsistent prayers that he holds them in golden bowls and they are the very incense of heaven. Isn't that incredible? And so, do you realize that the faintest, weakest prayer that we pray is, pray is the fastest, most mightiest thing on earth? It is faster, I mean, it can transcend all the way to the Holy of Holies instantaneously, um, putting us in connection with divine power. And so that's why uh, the priority of prayer and, and, and this, is, this is entering into my second point, if you're following. The first point is exposing the substitutes. Anything that dislodges this, even if it is a good thing, has distorted the role and mission of God. But the second point is that he establishes the priority of prayer because prayer is truly the most important conversation of the day. I really tried before I actually even set foot on the floor and especially because I am one of those people who is more sanctified by caffeine. I know that is a distortion of the fall, uh, but give me my cup of coffee. I mean, my wife is already, I know this makes me look like this husband wimp, but she's been up for an hour before I get up, but she gets up at 4.30. I am not sanctified at 4.30. I am not sanctified at 5.30. But if I put my feet on the floor then, um, I'm groping for the caffeine. Give me the caffeine. And then, then I'm a little bit fit for a God who loves me infinitely and unconditionally. But I'm not yet fit for a wife who loves me incredibly, graciously, beyond what I deserve, but not infinitely and unconditionally. So I, I've got to have that, right? But, but, but the most important conversation of the day is prayer. Not in order to get a better day, but to get a better me. Prayer is your most important conversation of the day. Again, not to get a better day, but to get a better you to face whatever day you're gonna have. And, and prayer happens in that, and, and it establishes the priority. It's why the one thing we see the apostles recorded asking Jesus to do is they say, Lord, teach us to pray like you do. And, and that tells us that if the Lord Jesus Christ, who is perfect and sinless, and who really was the embody, the, the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus in bodily form, he prayed and the disciples saw it. He retreated to the mountain. He spent whole nights in prayer. He rose up early to seek prayer alone. Um, this was, if this was a priority for him and he lived out of accessing the, the dynamism of the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need to, to be in prayer? And so this is the priority of God. It's what crowds out sin. It's, it's been remarked by many people that Praying and sinning really cannot coexist. And by that I mean, I don't mean the fact that we all sin, but I, but I mean deliberate sinning. Sinning when you know you're sinning. Sinning when you are volitionally choosing to sin. And it crowds it out, as we saw, not, not because uh, God can't look upon our sin, but because our sin can't stand his presence. And, if, and our God is such that if we say depart, we'll experience that departure uh, and here's what we know. If, if we win the victory in prayer, other victories will spin out of that. I, I've seen it so true that churches and seasons of life where the victory is being won in prayer, um, there are victories that will cascade out of that. And I admit sometimes it has just ambushed me. There, there was a, a couple seasons in our lives and in my life that, you know, one of, the, one of the things about cooling off in your relationship with God and backsliding is that you don't even realize that you're kind of there. 
And in, in the midst of it, there was this worship conference and it was 1999. And I attended the worship conference, was, it was good and they were having this evening session and I decided in probably a, a bit of carnality to skip out of the evening conference and to go home. And I did, but the Holy Spirit would not let me. He just like, it's like, you need to get back to that. And you need to take your son. My son was eight years old at the time. Nine, nine years old at the time. So I ate a quick hurry dinner, ran back in the car, got my son. And would you know, like that was the most, one of the most notable encounters I've had in my Christian life. It was a powerful searching sermon. It was a powerful a time of musical worship. But you know what was powerful is at the end of that, there was a move, it was spontaneous, it wasn't planned. Somebody said, I think we need to ask the pastors present here to come on the stage. And I, so I, I mean, it's just one of those moments where you just know God is not theoretical. He is, he is all there. And, and, and he is, is moving you and you feel that divine finger on your back because it's just like, we went to, and I'm like, well, nobody knows I'm a pastor here. <laughs> I had like a tank top and shorts on because I'd left the house hurriedly. Um, fortunately, that was the dress code, so I felt okay. But it was like, <laughs> I was using every excuse I could, but I, but I was drawing and as I, and my son's witnessing this. And, and I go, and they just, they bring a group of others and they lay hands on pastors and they minister in this incredible kind of, this, this guy, Bob Coughlin, if you've heard of him, he used to sing with Glad. He had this prayer that he composed in a song in the moment, in the minute. And it was like Jesus just had my number and was talking to me about discouragements that I wasn't even allowing myself to feel. And all of a sudden, I was just, I just broke down. I just, like, it was just a, it was one of those moments where I don't, I'm not a crier. I can be really sad and broken and not cry. I'm like, the fountain of tears just, just broke. And it was like, so right, and it's just an incredible moment, incredible moment for my son to experience. But you know what? Out of that moment of opening my heart in that moment, being prayed for, God ushered me in a new season. And I, and I say this because of how great God is. People began to notice, they say, Bob, something's different. And indeed, something changed. This is not in our head. There was, there was a more gentle confidence. There was a more like consistent joy. There was this sense of, of almost skipping to meet God <laughs> that, that I think I, I still live in the midst of. There was an impartation of something that happened because there was an opportunity to be prayed for and by God's grace, I accepted the nudge as he says, you go be prayed for. You, you, there's something for you to receive. And I went and I, I received it. And, and that's only one of the stories out of that. Then there just began a, a greater movement of prayer in, in our church in Maryland. And they, we had this idea of, let's get the men to pray. First Timothy 2.8 says, let's get the men. You know, for some reason, it's easier to get women to gather at a meeting that God is the only thing being offered and it seems harder to get men. And so we pushed, we, we got 25 men to go away on this retreat. God moved in some mighty powerful ways. And you know, people started commenting. They said, the atmosphere of this church has changed. And, and I can say, I, I began to note that, and there, there always are some praying people in a church, but it's like, that is, the, that is a power cell. It's not necessarily the people running and leading ministry or, or determining paths of ministry. That's important. It's good, but it's, it, it's, it's winning the victory in prayer. And I really believe the greatest thing that anyone can do for God and for other people is to pray. It's not the only thing, but it is, it is a chief thing that gets things moving. And to pay attention when God moves you to pray. Last, last week, our speaker, Rob Chifakoyo, and he just like, he loved you all. And I know you all loved him. If you weren't here, you want to get that message. <laughs> but I know, I'll just tell you, like the season in which I was led to pray for Rob was a, probably the hardest season of our lives. When I think about it, um, there was a satanic attempt, really, and it was Satan's fingers to, in a whole bunch of unfair distortions to just like, weigh in on one of our children. And you know what it is. I mean, it, it's not God's design, but when you're a parent, you are about as happy as your most unhappy child. 
um, and this was a crisis. It required intervention. It was, and, and there was a residual kind of malaise and depression. And because of the whole personal nature of it and so many things, it isolated us from friends. And, and other friends who we would have looked to for support kind of let us down. We began to let them into some of the difficulty, and they just kind of backed away. And it really felt, there were some friends who were champions. But, um, and we understand, we've, we've blown it with people who needed us at times, I'm sure, too. But it just was one of those times, it was a, a kind of malaise. But I'd heard that Rob was sick, and it really was true. Like, God was like, pray for this guy. And then as I prayed for him, he was like, do not let this stop with mere prayer. And it was like something I could not get out of my head. It's like, I, and, and I told Rob, and it was the first time I, I found out that he was so cheered up by my insomnia, which, um, <laughs> but, it, but it's like, I could not because I knew something else was happening. But I'll tell you, that whole thing was birthed not out of the immediate closeness of relationship or good circumstances or that I was happy in the Lord and walking closely and discerning the whole source of that was because God was going to change the narrative. For, for him, and I'd say for many, in, in so many ways for us. And, and prayer is the first thread to that. It, it's, it's, it's the fastest, most powerful thing on earth to change the narrative of our lives. And so, and so I look when we have opportunity to be prayed for. You know, when, it, when we travel to Zimbabwe, worship is, its duration is different. It's a whole day event. And I think in our, in our American version of things, there's been a lie told to us. And that is that if we can just get, attract people and get them to attend church for an hour, you know, if you, if you have decent, you know, music, if you have a kick and worship band, that's the best. And, and you have some caffeine out in the lobby to get people caffeinated, that's good. And, and you have an organized talk that's at least, you know, somewhat as polished as a TED talk. You can get people to come for an hour. Um, but the churches that are full of thousands and tens of thousands, if they simply advertise it's unplugged, no band, no teaching, nothing except we're going to get on our faces and knees before God, so many of those pastors and churches will say, we can hardly get anybody there. And, 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 and so something's wrong with that. that. That may be an American version of a consumer church I go to receive a product, but the whole package is in Acts 22 devoted to the apostles' teaching and to interlocking lives in fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And, and so the greatest blessing is this prayer. And so when we go to Zimbabwe, what we find is the end of the service will say, does anybody need prayer? Come up. Do you know what happens? Every single person in that service lines up, right? They line up and line up. I, the first time I went, I was starved because the service had gone four hours and I'd had a light breakfast and I was thinking, okay, it's the end of the service. They're asking for people to come up in prayer. We'll be out here in 10 minutes. And it was like 10 hours later. <laughs> it wasn't quite, but it was like, everybody's lining up. Because it was like they were passing out, I don't know, Lottery tickets to someone addicted to gambling. I don't know. It was just, it was like, why not me? Why, why not that opportunity? Uh, and, and so this is, this is what God's heart is, is that he wants, he wants to lift the narrative in our lives and he wants the church to be a place where that is regularly accessible and available. And... We're gonna, we're gonna do something this morning beyond simply teaching about prayer. And we're gonna give opportunity, and I, I pray this will always be true for us, but we wanna bring to the center of our service what I pray happens throughout our culture as a church. And I, I don't think that the, the way to prayer, by the way, is, I, I listened to this week with, to pastors who prayer is a really central thing in the church. So they've got 24 hour, you know, seven day a week prayer meetings going on, which I think is awesome if God does it. But I was relieved to hear one of the leaders of one of these movements saying, don't start with that. <laughs> you know, if you, if you start with that, like that's like asking someone who's, who's a weekend warrior for fitness to start by running a marathon. 
Don't do that. <laughs> but he said, start with simply, start with just opening your heart to prayer, opening the avenue to prayer, because the beautiful thing about prayer is it's a throne of grace. <laughs> The God who sits on this throne, who is holy and awesome, it, he's not approached with a stepladder that we produce our merit and our strength to. It is a throne of grace, and it says that we simply we can come before that throne to find mercy and grace in our time of need. And so I'm going to invite us um, today, and then following more intentionally at the end of each service, uh, with prayers at the front to be able to, to pray. But I'm not going to ask you to, you don't have to step up out of your seat. This is kind of an altar call where you are, that if, if you have come here and there is a kind of burden upon your heart that is particularly pressing. I know we're all in need of prayer. But we have seasons in our life, sometimes I call this the 2 a.m. test. If you were awakened at 2 a.m. for some reason, you just woke up, there's there's a singular concern that hits you and that is the burden upon your life. I'm gonna invite you to stand where you are and here's a few categories of them. One is it may be a desire for physical healing, relief uh, from pain and difficulty for yourself. You've got something going on and you are just, uh, you, your prayer is constant, even without words, you're saying, God, like lift this. God, like move in this. Lift it up or, or strengthen me in the midst of it. But Lord, you're the healer. Lift me up. That if that's on your heart for yourself or for others, I'm gonna invite you to stand. If, if there's, thank you. I think God sees that even. We're gonna pray for you. But um, I'm gonna open another area. If there is an issue in your life that you've just struggled to bring to God, because you've brought it to him again and again and again. And so it, it can be anything. You know what it is right now when I'm talking about it. And you're struggling because you brought it to him so many times and you just, you want to bring that today in a representative way. Please stand. If, if there is somebody in your life, you wake up at 2 a.m. and this is the person you're thinking of. Maybe you're thinking, how are they? Where are they? What's going on? And if there's just some relationship or burden or something that it is, it's, it's knotted up in you and you want to release it to God, I invite you to stand. I believe God is honored by your, this is a step of boldness. I want to say to all of you, you are touching the Lord's garment like the woman. You are touching the, his very robe. And I'm going to invite, if you are, if you know these folk who are standing, boy, so many of us are standing. I'm standing. <laughs> um, if you know some of these folk, and you just, you just want to move toward them, and if you know them to a point where you could just put a hand on their shoulder or lock arms with them, I'm going to invite you. You can walk across the room. If you see someone and you say, I'm praying for that, I'm praying for that, and I, I invite you to do that. Maybe you're already standing and you see someone, I'm going to stand with you. And this may turn into some praying before you leave here, uh, but I'm going to pray for you before we go into our, our song. And, and let's all join together. I know most of you are either standing or you're standing and reaching out to someone. Um, but let's, let's bow before our great God. I'm going to literally bow down on my knees and ask that God will move. So let's pray together. Oh God, you have said that you want the gathering of your children, your children who you love, you love for us to crawl up into your father lap and to just declare to you the, the wants and needs and desires of our heart. And Lord, I, I thank you for the privilege of through the merits of Jesus Christ and him alone, that I can speak words of powerful intercession because they're intercepted in Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so I pray right now that you would lift the burdens that by the very nature of standing, you have been brought before your all-knowing gaze. Lord, I pray first of all, you would communicate the love of Jesus Christ for each person in the midst of suffering.
to remember that Jesus suffered and he cried out with loud cries and with tears that were beyond words. I pray you would make known to these individuals that you hear their wordless prayers even when words fail them. And I pray right now, Lord, that you would be the God who brings breakthrough in life and spirit as well as in body and in relationship. I pray, oh God, that there would be testimonies from these trials and that there would be, Lord, the clear confirmation that this is what you were doing because this is who you are. And Father, we pray that no one who comes into the confines, even those who drive by, Lord, might somehow be turned toward you in a way that their burdens would be lightened. But we pray not just for lightening, we pray that you would lift those burdens off of our necks, off of our backs, to know that you are the one who will do it. You will drive those relationships into health. You will bring health to our bodies. It says you heal all of our diseases. Ultimately, we know, Lord, we are coming into a, a place, the new heavens and earth, new earth, where depression cannot stand, where broken bodies cannot stand, because you will be the Lord, our full healer. And so may we live in the joy and anticipation of that. And may you drop some first fruits here today, God. Lord, we don't want to be a church that plays church. So we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our praying muscles. That we would know that we are desperate apart from the movement of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts and upon the community and people we live around. And so God, would you continue us? Your word promises that when Jesus died you would, and was crucified, that as we look upon the son who was pierced, that you would pour out a spirit of prayer and supplication. Would you pour that spirit out? And Lord, if there's anyone else here who needs to be prayed for, may they be literally prayed for by someone who loves them uh, before they leave this place. We pray you would answer, you would be glorified as the God who loves and delights to surprise us with your power and goodness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people together said, amen. Amen. Praise God. That was a moment. Let's Let's conclude by singing of the greatness of our God. Let's lift up our voices together. You give life. You give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Just listen to that. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. You give life, you give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your
good ending to a service, how much we need God. <laughs> but prayer is the breath of God in our lungs. It really is. And so I want to invite, and I want to have, if, if you're part of the prayer team or you feel comfortable, I want a few of you to come forward just to be here on the platform with me. So if you're part of a prayer team or you're comfortable in intercession, please come to the front. It'd be good to have some men and women here, but let's, let's have a few. And so they're here for you. It may be here where you're sitting or even out in the lobby, but don't leave without concluding, uh, opening your heart for a burden you're bearing with someone if, if God's pressed that upon your heart. And that's something I wanna, I wanna make visible and accessible every time we open our doors. That should be something that takes place here. And now lift up your hearts to the God who wants us to know he cares and is present in our lives and receive his benediction. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's your breath in our